I'm glad you can join us for our online worship service today. This Sunday we are hoping to offer you a more complete worship experience by adding some music and some other ways that you can participate with us from a distance. To begin, if you are able, you can light a candle at home, um, just like this one here that I'm going to light. The flame of the candle helps to center us and reminds us that God's presence is with us. It helps to create a space that feels sacred. And also, if you'd like to add um, something purple to your worship space at home, this helps to remind us that we are in this Lenten season. So if you'd like to pause your video in order to add um, these elements to your worship space at home, you can do so now. When we light a candle at the beginning of our confirmation classes, we always begin our time while contemplating um, God's presence among us with this meditation. Give thanks to the Lord and make God's deeds known among the peoples. Remember the wonderful works that God has done. Remember God's covenant forever. Sing to the Lord all the earth and tell of God's salvation every day. And now that we are centered, we want to take a few um, we want to take a few moments to share just a couple announcements. All of the church events for the next week have been canceled or postponed. We hope to be back in one another's presence very soon. But for now, as a preventative measure, we're being asked to remain in our homes. As Pastor Jim shared last week, we as Methodists are called to model John Wesley's three simple rules. Do no harm, do good, and stay in love with God. We continue to do no harm, by not putting others at risk of getting sick, washing our hands, using hand sanitizer, and staying at home when we don't feel well. We do good by still striving to be the church during this time, offering help to those who are not able to go out, meeting the needs of our community in ways that we can while maintaining our social distance. One way we have sought to do this is by providing community-free Wi-Fi on our church property for those who need it. If anyone can think of other ways that we can continue to do good in our community during this time, please don't hesitate to share that with us and stay in love with God. Continue diligently in your study of scripture, in your prayer life, and attending worship with us online. We hope to be able to join one another again in communal efforts of this very soon. As we live into the next couple of weeks, please stay updated on what's going on at our church through our website, and also be sure to check your emails. So now let's turn to God in prayer this morning. Let us pray. Holy God, we are grateful for these days of Lent, a time to think about the life of Jesus and the men and women who followed him. We bring our doubts, our struggles, our fears, and our yearnings for new life. We come to give thanks to God who offers all of us deeper relationship with Jesus Christ. Let us join our hearts in worship today. Amen. And now let us sing together our hymn of praise, the hymn of promise. Unrevealed until its season 
something God alone can see. In our end is our beginning, in our time infinity, in our doubt there is believing, in our life eternity, in our death the resurrection, and the last of the Something God alone can see. Good morning. How's everyone? We certainly miss you. I hope everyone is feeling well and working hard on all your schoolwork and not bothering mom and dad too very much. Are we ready for a story? Very good. Once upon a time, a long, long time ago, there was a tiny little cat named Itty Bitty Kitty Witty. Now, it was three o'clock in the morning, and Itty Bitty was very, very nervous. He had not been to sleep all night, and he, he just didn't know what to do. So he went in and found Big Mama and Big Daddy and snuggled in the basket with them under Big Mama's head. Well, of course, this woke her up, and she said, Son, what's the matter? Oh, Mom, I don't know. I'm just so anxious and nervous, and all this stuff with this virus just has me all upset. Are we all going to be sick? No, no, son, you don't need to worry about that. We kitties can't get that virus, so we're all safe but I know you must miss all your friends. I do. They're not here. Where are they? They're all at home. But just because they're at home doesn't mean you can't go visit them if we can find a way to get you there. Really? Really. That's right. Son, have you prayed about this yet? No, Mom, I haven't. Well, you need to do that, and you need to remember that God's got this. God is in control, always. That's right, he is. So you don't need to worry at all. So now just snuggle down and go to sleep. And remember, anytime you walk around, when you stop, be sure and wash your paws. Okay, Mom, I think I can go back to sleep now. The end. Let's have a prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for taking care of us and being in control of every situation. In your name we pray. Amen. We come to a time of prayer in our service today. And today we have several prayer requests we'd like to lift up to God. We remember Tom Burns and Doug Jones, June Umholtz, Renda Barrier, Susan Morgan, Mary Castaneda, all of those working in the medical field, Christy Gingrey's co-worker Joan Wilson, and Christy's friend Judy Coyer, Becky Stevens, the family of Kelly Brentnell at the passing of her father, the family of Robert Cobb at his passing, And if I'm missing anyone, I apologize. Um, You can lift those folks up to God now by saying their names aloud. God hears all of our concerns, those we say aloud and those that we lift up in our hearts. So today, let's go to God in prayer. Oh Lord, we want to be Christians in our hearts. We want to take the time to invite others to encounter your healing and saving presence. We are mindful of the overwhelming news of significant health concerns facing our world. We especially pray for those who are most vulnerable to the virus that is spreading. We are reminded of how interconnected the world is and how easily viruses can be spread from person to person. But Lord, we are also reminded 
that you are the one to whom we can turn during times of uncertainty and fear. You are the one who took just five loaves and two fish and were able to feed a multitude. Sometimes our discipleship involves very simple things like checking on the well-being of a neighbor, providing Wi-Fi to our community school children, and participating in an online Sunday worship service. In all of these ways, we are your disciples. We are inviting others to encounter your healing and your saving presence. In these anxious times, we especially pray for world health experts and community leaders in determining the best courses of action for helping to stop the spread of the virus. Help each of us to be attentive, not just to our own needs, but to the needs and fears of others. Draw our attention to your son, Jesus, because he modeled to us how to remain calm even during very anxious and fearful times. Lord, all those that we have named today, either out loud or in our hearts, God, we lift them to you to be in your tender care. And at this time, I invite each one of us to extend our hands in front of us with our palms facing upward and silently to offer you any fears and anxieties that we may be carrying in this moment. And as we name those concerns, we allow them to be lifted to you, our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, who is more than able to fill our hearts with peace. In fact, our hands like this are extended not only to offer the load of our burdens today, but also to receive the comforting gift of God's peace. So Lord, we are just going to take a few moments to offer our burdens to you and to receive any gifts that you have for us. And with our palms still extended, we join together to pray the prayer that you invite us to say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now come to a time of thanksgiving and offering. There are several ways that you can participate in this. Um, if you are able to give through the Tithely app, you are welcome to do that. Um, please be sure to check the box that says you'll cover the small fee for us so that we'll be able to receive 100% of your donation. You can give online through our website. You can continue to give through your bank. Or you're welcome to write a check and mail that to us. We are so grateful for your continued, continued faithfulness in your giving, especially during these weeks where we're not able to meet in person. Let us now pray and dedicate our offering to God. Good and faithful God, we bring our tithes and offerings to you this morning as part of our act of praise. In your grace and love, let it overflow to reach and bless others. May we not only see, this, see it this way, but may we live it in lives of generosity. In the name of Christ, who gave all and held nothing back. Amen. Good morning, and before we dive into the scripture and sermon today, I wanted to offer a reminder. What is worship? As we live into this weird time that we're in, let us remember what truly worship is. Worship is what is a gift to God. It is what we offer God. 
So however we can do it, whether it's through online, whether it's personally as you read Scripture and the sermon, whether, however it is that you are going to connect with this or whatever you're going to offer God this morning, simply remember that that's what it is. It's an offering to the God that we worship. So with that, hear now the Scripture. It comes out of the Gospel of John, 11th chapter. I encourage you to pick up your Bible if you have it with you and read along. I'll be starting in verse 17, reading through 44. So hear now the Word of God. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was a little less than two miles from Jerusalem. Many Jews had come to comfort Martha and Mary after their brother's death. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him while Mary remained in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. Jesus told her, your brother will rise again. Martha replied, I know that he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. Whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She replied, Yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, God's Son, the one who is coming into the world. After she said this, she went and spoke privately to her sister Mary. The teacher's here, and he's calling for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to Jesus. She hadn't entered the village, but Jesus was still in the place. He hadn't entered the village, but he was still in the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews were comforting Mary in the house, saw her get up quickly and leave, they followed her. They assumed she was going to mourn at the tomb. When Mary arrived where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. When Jesus heard her crying, the Jews who had come were crying with her were crying also. He was deeply disturbed and troubled. He asked, Where have you laid him? They replied, Lord, come and see. And Jesus began to cry. The Jews said, See how much he loved him? But some of them said, He healed the eyes of the man born blind. Couldn't he have kept Lazarus from dying? Jesus was deeply disturbed again when he came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone that covered the entrance. Jesus said, Remove the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said, Lord, the smell will be awful. He has been dead for four days. Jesus replied, Didn't I tell you that if you believe, you will see God's glory? So they removed the stone. Jesus looked up and said, Father, thank you for hearing me. I know you always hear me. I say this for the belief of the crowd standing here, so that they will believe that you sent me. Having said this, Jesus shouted with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his feet bound, his hands tied, and his face covered with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Untie him and let him go. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be gracious and glorious in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. A member at my last appointment, my last church, was a funeral director at the local funeral home. And so, because of that, I got a call quite often to see if I would officiate a stranger's funeral. She'd call me up and say, well, Mr. or Mrs. so-and-so, they would like a minister to do their funeral for their loved one, and they don't have a home church. Now, I saw this as a ministry, and it it put me in contact with people that I would have never seen otherwise. For one of these funerals, I met with a deceased wife and asked what she wanted out of this service. I didn't know what to make of it, but she said, I really don't want a religious funeral. And although I was puzzled by this, I took it as a challenge and agreed to do it. Now, when I met with this man's wife, I learned that they had had not been to a church in a long time. They weren't really religious people. They went to church maybe every so often on Easter or Christmas, but but religion in their home country of Germany, it just wasn't pushed, and so they never really went. 
I thought it was interesting that this non-religious person was wanting a pastor to do their husband's funeral. And I explained what I usually do for funerals, and I told her that I can keep it short and simple, which she liked. And while I was writing up and summing up this man's life, or at least the part that his wife told me about, I wrestled with what to say. I could go through the timeline of his life, share the important things that she shared with me. That's simple enough to do. But what do I say to her? What do I say to people that were there at the funeral mourning the loss of their friend or loved one? I mean, I'm a minister. I'm a, I'm a Christian. And we believe some things about death. I promised that I wouldn't do some kind of major altar call or some kind of evangelical plea, and I, I reassured her I, I don't do that for funerals. Funerals are a time for comfort and for hope and for peace and for tears. It's a time to sit in the midst of our vulnerability and know that God's presence is there with us and mourns with us. So when the day came, and I was speaking at this man's funeral, I simply shared what I believe happens at death. And that's a major question we all have. What happens after we die? There's only one person who has truly been resurrected for eternity, and he wasn't too clear on these matters after he came back. Here we are in Lent 4, the, the fourth week of Lent. We haven't met since week 2, and so it seems really weird, but still we are in this Lenten journey, which began on Ash Wednesday. And as we gathered on that night to have ashes placed on our foreheads in the sign of a cross, we remind ourselves that we are mortal and that we are finite creatures. Once we are born, we are dying. We are all heading in the same direction. Some of us just take longer to get there than others. And if we all are going to die, then why don't we know what happens? There seems so much uncertainty when it comes to death. The great thinker Tertullian said this, It's a poor thing to fear that which is inevitable. And despite Tertullian's point, many of us fear death because it is the great unknown, even though it's inevitable. My grandmother was the first person I knew who passed away. She died of lung cancer when I was 16 years old. And I remember lying in bed one night after her funeral, just kind of thinking and wrapping my head around the fact that she died and wondering what happened when she died. Did she feel anything? Was there some kind of great light? Was it something different? Her death left me uncertain. In the scripture today, we hear the same thing kind of echoed as Jesus resurrects his friend Lazarus. There's so much of this story that really I couldn't take up that much time, so I wanted to read just simply the last half of it. I encourage you to go back, but here's kind of a summation of what happens in those first, 10 ver first 16 verses of chapter 11. In the first half of the story, Martha and Mary, they send word to Jesus that Lazarus is very sick. Very sick. Because they know who Jesus is and the power that he has to heal. They know that Jesus loves them and cherishes them as a friend, so they beg him to come and to heal their brother. Does Jesus go? No. He doesn't go right away. In verse 4 it says, When he heard this, Jesus said, This illness isn't fatal. It's for, God, it's for the glory of God so that God's Son can be glorified through it. Jesus waits two whole days even before starting to head in Lazarus' direction. And when he finally gets there... They learned Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Jesus took his dear old sweet time getting there. And to many people there, he got there way too late. When Jesus does arrive, Martha goes out to meet him. And when she sees him, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Even now I know that whatever you ask God, God will give you. You can, you can sense there's, this, there's a tone to Mary's voice. You know that tone when you get, that you get from your spouse when you've left for vacation and you forgot to take out the trash? Remember that the trash had those chicken bones in it, and now after a week's vacation at the beach in the middle of summer, you come back and your house smells like rotten chicken. So now every time you take out the trash, you get that tone of, remember what happened last time? This kind of seems like the tone that Martha has for Jesus. Mary does the same thing and has a similar tone. When she shows up, it, she's almost inconsolable. 
she says to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And how many of us, when we are facing issues with uncertainty, with pain or grief, with hurt or tears rolling down our face, would look at Jesus and say the same thing? How many of us have looked to God and blamed God for the tragedy in our lives? How many of us wonder if God caused this pandemic that we're living through? If you don't think it, I'm sure you have a friend that thinks God is the one who started all of this. But what I love is Jesus' response to both of these sisters. When Jesus walks and talks with Mary, people are surrounding her. In verse 33 it says, When Jesus saw her crying and the Jews who had come with her crying also, he was deeply, deeply disturbed and troubled. The people following Mary were crying with her. They weren't telling her to get over her grief four days later. They weren't telling her that poor theology of everything happens for a reason. No, they were there in the midst of her grief. And when Jesus sees it, he is moved too. This interaction leads to one of the most memorized pieces of Scripture of all time, John eleven thirty five, 35, which in some translations simply say it as, Jesus wept. Or as the one I read said, Jesus began to cry. It's popular because it's so short. But I love this verse because it shows that Jesus was attached to the emotions and the suffering around him. Jesus understood to the point that he was deeply disturbed and troubled. Jesus chose to sit in the midst of this and to have empathy for what was going on. When it came to his interaction with Martha, Jesus was a little different. Maybe it was because Martha wasn't feeling emotional that day. Maybe Martha was a type of person who had to be doing something all the time. She was, she was busy keeping her mind busy. To Martha, Jesus said, your brother will rise again. Then Martha replies, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus tells her this infamous verse, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, as I reread this passage, it, it kind of took me by surprise because when I realized that last question is there. In the book of discipline, when, in the book of worship, when we start funerals, this verse is there. And I usually start funerals by walking up to the front with a casket there before the family enters. And I have everyone stand and I read this piece of scripture. But then it always stops short. It leaves out the last question. But what if I didn't? <clears throat> what if I asked that question? What kind of message would that bring? Do you, do the people of this church for this funeral... This congregation, do you believe in what Jesus is telling us when he says, I am the resurrection and the life? My question to you is, do you believe this? <clears throat> Martha replies that she does, but she believes in the resurrection on the last day and that Jesus Christ is Lord, God's Son. But what is it that you believe? There really isn't this consistent and easily explained thread throughout the Bible which talks about what happens after the life of death. In the Psalms, there's this reference to this place called Sheol, which is spelled S-H-E-O-L. It's referred to as the place of the dead. Sheol is a concept where all the dead went. This included humans or animals, those who were righteous and those who weren't. Everyone went to the same place. We can see this image played out in Jesus' parable about Lazarus and the rich man. Now, this is a different Lazarus than what we are talking about today, the one that he resurrects. Lazarus was a poor man who lived at a gate, and a rich man just he, he treated him badly, and then they both die. In Sheol, the, uh, the rich man sees Lazarus and wants him to dip his finger into water and lightly put it on his tongue to kind of quench the, the fire that's burning there. So, is this what happens after death? There's two great stories in the Old Testament about people who go to God, but in some very non-traditional ways. Enoch is a person in Genesis, and really all we know about him is this. He walked with God and disappeared because God took him. All right. Then there's Elijah in 2 Kings 2, verse 11. We get his story. It talks about him and Elijah, and it says, They were walking along, talking, when suddenly a fiery chariot and fiery horses appeared and separated the two of them. Then Elijah went up to heaven in a windstorm. 
mean, both of these, they, they, these two people, Enoch and Elijah, they kind of get sucked up into heaven. I, and I think it'd be kind of cool if a fiery horse or chariot that swoops down and takes us to heaven. I mean, that's pretty cool. But I've yet to see that. Then you have this weird kind of passage in 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. It's, it's highly debated. It's a highly debated verse that people have, some people have recreated a whole different theology and outlook over our faith. They've, this came out in about the 1800s, and they created this idea of the rapture. Here's what 1 Thessalonians says. This is because the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a signal of a shout from the head angel and a blast of God's trumpet. First, those who are dead in Christ will rise. Then we who are living and still around will be taken up together with them in the clouds to meet with the Lord in the air. Now this seems to echo Matthew's 24th chapter when Jesus is talking about two people who are working and one is taken up and the other one is left. But once again, the rapture is an idea that didn't exist until John Darby created it and thought of it in the 1800s. And now it's all over our American culture, yes, but it, is truly, it truly isn't a traditional theological stance that we've had for a very long time. Then, kind of the fourth perspective is what Jesus says to the criminal on the cross. Jesus looks at the criminal and says, Today you will be with me in paradise. There's an immediacy in this action. Jesus doesn't say, After three days, when I rise again, then you'll be with me. He doesn't say that. He doesn't say, Look, i got to go get the keys from heaven. I'll be back. And when I get back, you'll come with me into heaven. doesn't say that. Jesus says, Today. This criminal won't have to wait in Sheol, be buried, and then wait for the sound of a trumpet to be woken up again. Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. There seems to be very the four different perspectives, four different ideas of what happens at death. Now this tends to make us even more uncertain. It doesn't give us a lot to hold on to, does it? So what do we believe? One way to really understand our beliefs is to look at our creeds. Now, we profess every week a creed as a reaffirmation of our faith, affirming what we believe. And the creeds are summations of exactly that, what we believe. The Apostles' Creed, which we traditionally say at each worship service, was, uh, was one of the first ones that were ever created. In the first few lines, it says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, or in the last few lines, the last section. It says, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, meaning the universal church, the communion of saints, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. The resurrection of the body, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. But what does that mean? I mean, we know God made us. The Psalms state that we are fearfully and wonderfully made. God looks at all creation at the end of the creation stories in Genesis and says, It is good. God knows what God created and looks at each and every one of us with love and sees us as good, worthy enough to be saved. McGray de Vega, the author of this series, says this, Our bodies are essentially good, beautiful gifts from God, and God is therefore very interested in resurrecting these bodies. What will those bodies look like? Will we be young and attractive? Will we be the young and attractive Elvis or the fatter, older, unhealthy Elvis? A woman lost her husband when she was in her 20s. And as she laid on her deathbed 60 years later, she asked McGray de Vega what kind of body she will have in heaven. Will she meet her husband when he was 20 and she was in her 80s? Or will they both have their be in their 20-year-old bodies again. Because if we believe in the resurrection of the body, then what does that really look like? Now Paul provides some deep scriptural evidence for this. In his letter to the Corinthians, he writes a lot about this in the 15th chapter. And it he says this, When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't come back to life unless it dies. What you put in the ground doesn't have the shape that it will have, but it will bear grain of wheat or some other seed. The seed we plant doesn't look like the plant that grows. The seed changes after it dies. It's essentially the same thing, it's just different. 
Now Paul continues, It's the same with the resurrection of the dead, a rotting body put into the ground, but what is raised will never decay. It degrades when it is put into the ground, but is raised in glory. It is weak when it is put into the ground, but is raised in power. It is a physical body when it is put into the ground, but it is raised as a spiritual body. It is there, if there is a physical body, there is also a spiritual body. We believe in the resurrection of the body, but we are not quite sure what that looks like. Now, with all this uncertainty about our mortality and what happens when we die, where do we go from here? I love how De Vega puts it in his book. Just because there are things in your I don't know box doesn't mean your I believe box should be empty. Hear that again. Just because there are things in your I don't know box doesn't mean your I believe box should be empty. In other words, just because we don't know all the details of our spiritual bodies in heaven doesn't mean that we don't believe in them. Jesus looks at Martha and says, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will live even though they die. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? My question for us today is, do we believe this? If so, then we can live in the midst of uncertainty, without proof of what happens or without all the answers. We can live in the midst of this coronavirus, social distancing and online worship, and we can still have hope. We can live in the knowledge of God's promise, but also in the hope of what is to come. If we had proof, if we had all the answers, if we knew exactly what would happen, then it wouldn't be called faith. So may we live out our belief in what is professed and what is to come, and always know it is good. And all God's people said, Amen. Let us pray. Lord, we're facing a lot of uncertainty now. There's a lot that we don't know. And there's some things that we do know. We know you are God, our God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We know we are loved by you, forgiven by you, offered grace through you, and saved through you. May we find real hope in this, a hope that surpasses all understanding and lasts for eternity. Although we don't understand everything, we can rest assured that you do, and that our faith in you can see us through this time. So speak to us, touch us, and assure us of this hope. For it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. I thank you for joining us today. Please stay tuned next week. Um, We will not have worship in our sanctuaries again for March 29th, but we will be offering this again. Please be on a lookout for your, uh, your neighbors. Keep our distance, let us wash our hands, let's do what the CDC and uh, those experts are telling us to do so that we can live through this and get through this together as a community, as, a, as neighbors. Let us love our neighbors by helping out when we can, but also keeping our distance to those who are the most vulnerable. I thank you for being with us today, and so now hear this benediction. Go out into this world with so many uncertainties and unknowns. And know that God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit has us, loves us, looks at us and says, you are good. May we have this hope that our faith can see us through. Go in peace. Amen.